Cracking the code viewers, you love to send us all kinds of video clips of your playing, usually accompanied by uh, the typical SOS message of, hey man, I'm trying to do this thing and I can't do this thing and I really need you to help me. Now we're usually pretty swamped and don't often have a chance to take a look at these clips, but once in a while uh, we'll get a, a moment or two to pop them open. And once in a while we do, and these supposedly broken guitar clips actually look kind of interesting. And we say, you know, we get these all the time, why don't we just take a few of these and throw them up on a channel and see what everyone else thinks about them. They're fun to look at, gives you a chance to utilize your cracking the code mechanical analyses skills to stretch those legs a little bit. And it also gives you the opportunity to understand what other players do out in the world. What, is, what does other technique look like? We know what the best techniques look like because they were hired to make instructional videos in the 80s and then the 90s. But we never really had a good sense of what the man on the street or the woman on the street, what that playing technique looks like. And as we're beginning to develop that better sense, we're starting to discover all kinds of really cool things. The clip that we put up uh, that you just saw a moment ago is, is one of those examples where we pop that open and my immediate response was, hey, this looks kind of interesting. I wonder uh, what other people might think of this. So we put it up on the channel and it's been viewed, I guess, about 3,000 times or so now. And in scanning those comments, one, one thing I'm noticing is that there is mostly a commentary of the critical nature. And I don't mean that negatively, but in the sense of attempting to decipher what might be wrong about this playing that you're seeing here. And it's, I saw something about um, there needs, this player needs to use a, a fatter pick that could work, or the pickup height is too high, or there's too much bouncing movement with the hand, he's not gonna be able to play fast. And that's fine, you should be looking for these kinds of things. But there was, on the flip side, no positive commentary. There was nothing of the sort that said, hey, that aspect of what this person is doing could be the kernel of something good, maybe he should do more of that. And this is surprising to me because we thought the channel would be all over this. We gave you a hint in the video description. We said, this is someone who sent us this clip and in the typical fashion said, hey, there may be some concerns about things that are broken here in my technique that could use fixing, but we might not necessarily agree. That was your hint. So perhaps we should take another look at this clip to find out what those kernels of positivity might in fact be. Let's take a, another watch. Okay, this is the descending nines clip. We've seen it in the anti-gravity pack. It's a classic two-way pick slanting pattern. And it was sent to us by Keen, who is a longtime Cracking the Code viewer. In fact, Keen sent us a note, or sent me a note eight years ago, long before Cracking the Code was anything like it is now. It, it was just a website with some clips of players that I'd interviewed on weekends for fun, and a couple of blog articles on how to play Yngwie Malmsteen solos. And the email request was of the standard variety. Hey man, I found your website and I have some concerns about my playing technique, typically of the speed and accuracy variety, which is the most common request of this sort, even to this day. Of course, at the time, there would have been no way to really know what his technique looked like. Yes, you could get a camcorder and put it on a tripod and film yourself and maybe send it to YouTube or something in 320 by 240 format or something. But uh, it was by no means as easy as um, the current day where we use a device typically reserved for phone calls to produce video that looks better than what you could have gotten with a laboratory full of equipment in the 80s, of course. So fast forward to a few days ago when this email came in, accompanied by the clip that you watched just uh, a moment ago. And I looked at this and said, hey, this actually looks pretty good. <laughs> Again, this is the descending nines pattern. It's a classic two-way pick slanting pattern. For point of comparison, here is my take on this. And there's the down, up, rotate, up, down, rotate, just like we talked about in Conquering the Scale. And we talk about an extreme detail in the anti-gravity seminar. This is the classic two-way pick slanting hand movement that allows you to navigate the strings on odd numbered groupings like this. And if we look at Keen's version of this, you can see there is in fact some two-way pick slanting happening, although it is rather intermittent. See if you can spot it.
right there. And we have that very telltale rotational movement. The hand is turning, the pick is going from the B string down to the G string, and it's making that movement. But if we look at the rest of the clip, you'll notice this is not actually happening continuously in the way that it is when I play it. Noticing two way pick slanting only happening on the inside string changes. For example, between the high E string and the B string, where we go down, up, down, and then we have the rotate, we go to the next string, but then we don't see it on the transition from the B string to the G string. That's up, down, up, down, up, down, and that would be an outside string change, and therefore we're not seeing it. But then if we continue the pattern, the next sequence would be the next change to the B string would be outside then we have up down up that's outside again going to the G but then from the G to the D we again see this movement there it is Right, so what's going on here? We only have two-way pixel anything happening on the inside string changes. This seems wrong, right? Or is it? <laughs> Morse, of course. It is in fact very common. That's the descending sixes pattern with a string skip in the middle. And the increasing of the distance there, when you find that, you, you see these licks that skip over strings, you tend to see these larger pick slanting movements to help kind of get over the hump so that you don't hit what you're, not just the string that you're trying to jump over, but the string that you just played. That's really why this is happening in, the term, in terms of inside string changes like this. So Steve, even though he is largely a cross-picking kind of guy, you definitely see these two-way pick slanting tendencies in his playing. And to wit, also Martin Miller, for example. We talked about the glass prison arpeggios in our analysis of Martin, and he noticed this himself. Here's what that looks like. Definitely a very, very big slant happening here. The five-note shape is a two-way slant. So you're, you're changing the... Yeah, I'm definitely down. noticing how I slant okay. upwards. He's noticing here that he does this two-way pick slanting movement when, of course, on the inside string change between the B string and the G string, because he's moving this way. He doesn't want to hit the B string as he's coming over the top, so he's giving us an extra boost so that he doesn't do it. And so this aspect of what Keen is doing is actually fairly typical. Checkbox. Okay, not concerned by it. I don't care if it's a big movement or a small movement. It's, it's a movement that we see elsewhere, so that doesn't concern me. The real second, I think the most salient observation here, and the one that he pointed out in uh, the email, was that he said, hey, I filmed myself and all of a sudden I saw all this extraneous movement and I'm noticing now all of a sudden I'm, I have too much motion. I'm doing all this extraneous stuff that I don't see you doing in your clip. And it, Excess motion, it's like a trigger word for guitar players, right? Everyone loves to fuss over excess motion. It's not efficient, you're using too much movement. But this is a bit of a red herring. Most of the time, the concern about making too many movements or too much movements is largely misplaced. The size of the movement is much less important than, <laughs> read into that, this is much less important than the, the movement which is simply not the right movement for that kind of phrase. What is he talking about? Let's take a look. Picking movements, these extraneous picking movements. This is probably what somebody was referring to in the commentary about the jumping movements or the bouncing. We talked about bouncing. That's not really what's happening here, though. These, where have we talked about this curved picking movement before? We, in fact, we talked about it quite a bit. What is it? It's cross picking. So what we're seeing here in Keane's technique, amazingly, is that his, what seems to be his fundamental base picking movement is actually a cross picking pick stroke. Starts up here in the air, comes down and hits the string comes out the other side. And this is a movement that is critical to playing more complicated phrases, especially when you have to move across the strings. Of course, two-way pick slanting can do this, and there's some point at which you could semantically say that constant two-way pick slanting is in fact a form of cross-picking, yada yada. Sure, that's great, but the point here is that 
you see this clip and it immediately should leap out at you that this picking movement is quite non-standard, at least for what we think of uh, in terms of the frequency of this occurring in famous rock and jazz players where you just really don't see this very often. So to, uh, to take this a little bit further, I thought, well, why not see, you know, technically this ability should allow him to do uh, to, to play some of these more interesting, um, sophisticated patterns. So we sent him the following piece of tablature, this example here, which is a very simple one note per string arpeggio using the C major shape. And without over explaining things, I just said, hey, listen, t take a crack at this. Just play this. And don't think too much about your picking movement, mainly because I could see that he was already doing this. So what, don't change what ain't broke, right? I said, just do this. See if you can play this lick and film it if, if you can do it and send it to us. Long story short, he did this, he sent back the clips, and so this, um, the broken picking technique, playing the arpeggio, the bouncing, the inefficient, what does it look like? Let's take a look. <laughs> Amazing, right? How good does this look? This is an absolutely textbook example of what we would call the deviation style cross-picking movement where you use mainly the wrist moving back and forth with a little bit of an assist from flexion and extension on the downstroke below the string, yada yada. We've talked about this extensively in some of our uh, other analysis videos, the Albert Lee stuff, and uh, quite a bit in Masters of Mechanics. But this is an absolutely fantastic version of this. It's clean, it's speedy, it looks not string hoppy. We've talked about that as kind of the evil twin of, of cross-picking. You keyed into this curved movement in the picking, and yes, but why is that not bouncing? It's not bouncing because it's efficiently alternating. That's kind of what cross-picking is. It's the alternate picking. It's a U-shape that is, it is a true alternate picking movement because the downstroke and the upstroke don't share any mechanical components. So. If you look at just the picking movement, you can see we still have this very uniform and, and rather attractive curved U-shape. What's ironic, of course, about this is not just that we have someone who's trying to fix a thing which is demonstrably not, sh not to be touched. It's actually great. In fact, if anything, it's to be streamlined and improved upon, but definitely not to be fixed. But the, the irony here, of course, is this is a thing that a lot of players find challenging to do. Players work, well, spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to play these kinds of lines, and many of them gave up. Eric Johnson talks about this in one of his instructional videos, where he kind of makes this movement in the air. And, it could be, you could think of it as two-way pick slanting, you could think of it as cross-picking, but he says, hey, you know, I've been trying to figure out how to get this to work and I can't get it to work. And the guy's a genius, right? In fact, what's also really interesting, just speaking of Eric Johnson, is that Keen, in the original email that, the thread that we had on this, he said, he actually used the term poor and incorrect to describe this movement. And again, we're all our own worst critics. And so that's to be, that's normal, right? You, everybody looks in the mirror and thinks they're fat, right? So... But, you know, in, in looking at this clip, you realize what loaded terms those are because, and I realize now after um, thinking about this, that poor, in, incorrect, these are almost never terms that I use to describe anything. Um, because there are so many different guitar playing movements that we know to be, let's say, suboptimal in some way, but that can be used to great effect by great players. And again, back to Eric Johnson, the, the string hoppy thing, which he calls the bounce technique, we know that this is not a thing you can do very fast, and we know that it, it's tiring and it's tense, and Eric himself describes this in one of his instructional videos, but what does he do? He turns around and makes incredibly beautiful music with it. There's this incredible lyrical uh, sk string skippy arpeggio things that he, he does, and it's, he's using the wrong technique, the, the incorrect one. So I'm really hesitant to describe anything as incorrect or wrong. If it makes beautiful music, as far as I'm concerned, it is A-OK. -okay. Instead, if we take a more value-neutral judgment on this, what we can say very simply is that this is a technique, this, this true cross-picking thing, is a thing that you can do faster. And we can see already that these, the speed here, I don't know what the tempo is, but it's not slow. <laughs> It's, it's not Yngwie fast, 
but this is certainly in Pat Martino territory. You could take this technique and you could play all kinds of cool jazz lines with this without having to worry too much about what the exact sequence of, of uh, string changes is in the pattern. You know, the, the possibilities here are really quite, uh, quite serious. And, and so the interesting thing, of course, is that presumably this is a way that King has been playing for a long time without realizing it. And again, these techniques are things that players learn at a subconscious level, at a level of feel. If you were to film uh, great cross pickers like Chris Thiele or uh, Andy Wood, for example, a monster player coming up soon in Masters in Mechanics, you would see basically the same kind of movements. Here's um, Andy is, is really an all-rounder flat picker, incredible two-way pick slanter. That's very controlled. That's very surgical to me. Incredible cross picker. Like. Incredible combiner of both techniques. And Andy learned these movements when he was, he started playing in the early, late single digits, like seven, eight years old. He started on mandolin. And at that age, we're just sponges, right? So we, we were able to solve these complicated mechanical challenges. And Andy, of course, is a bit of a savant in this respect. He's able to play things with alternate picking that most players just stay clear from. And he doesn't really key into the fact at a conscious level that he's making these different movements. But you can get him to, uh, in our conversation, you, you, we got him to kind of uh, understand the difference in feel. There's a great moment where we talk about the difference between the cross picking movement and, and the more straight line pick slanting technique. And we had to create kind of a you know, words for this that, that key into the feel of it. We started calling this the smiley face technique. Check it out. If I'm doing a one string. Do you feel the smiley face movement there? Very, very little, if at all. So I, I think you're it. doing it. No, that's, I think, that's what I'm saying is I don't feel it. You ask if I felt it. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I don't feel it. Am I doing it? Most likely. Right. Do I feel it? No. And if I do feel it, it's very little. But if you speed up now, I think that's just going to become more of a straight back and forth. Yeah. So there it is, the two picking movements, the one that's curvy and then the other one that goes straight back and forth in more of the, let's call it the pick slanting or the one-way pick slanting movement. and he's sort of aware that it's happening, but it's very clear these are two different modes. And he has this um, innate ability to just learn this stuff at an early age. And clearly what we're seeing here, I, I guess, in Keane's playing is that a certain amount of that has already happened. And it happened perhaps backwards to the way that it happened, let's say in my case, where I was able to figure out the one-way pick slanting and then the two-way pick slanting and this progression. He had figured out the cross-picking thing first, and that's fantastic. So what is the takeaway here? Well, the, the takeaway for him is that he's got one of the big tools in the toolbox already. And now maybe the next thing to figure out is how to do the straight line movement, the surgical movement. Is that, that's what Andy, we called it in uh, Andy's interview. He thinks of this as surgical and precise, and he thinks of the other one as the smiley face or that's used for the more awkward, uh, sophisticated kind of phrases. So if you've got the one movement, then you get the other movement, and you combine them, and really the, the sky's the limit. But this is... It's really pretty fascinating, right? Here we have the opportunity with the tech that we have now, with social media, to take a look at things in a way that absolutely would have been science fiction back in the day. When, when I was a kid, your knowledge of what technique should look like started with you, it went to your friends, and then once you got beyond that immediate circle, it was just mystery and legend. <laughs> it's like, hey, there's a guy in the next town over that can play Eruption, and he's really good, and there, I heard there's a dude two towns over that could do Ingve, but I'm not sure, because I only heard that from a guy who talked to a guy who saw him once at his house before he moved, <laughs> and you're just like, it was like Quest for Fire. Like, I hear they got fire a few towns over, but it's too risky, I don't think we should you know, chance it. And now, of course, we take a device that was formerly used to make phone calls and we plug it into the, the interwebs and we beam these images all over the world and, and we can now get a look at a thing that is clinically com superior to what we would have had health, not just in the 80s, but it's superior to what like the NFL had 15 years ago, right? HD level 240 frames per second slow motion is pretty crazy. And 
the real power of this is uh, is in understanding the distribution of human ability. And with respect to this cross-picking movement, I think that if you gave 1,000 people a camera, and, or 10,000 people, 100,000 people uh, cameras, and you start to look at this stuff, we would see all kinds of things that maybe we didn't realize were as common as they are. And maybe this would give us a better idea of not just what we can do today, but what we all might be able to do in the future. And that is what Cracking the Code is all about. Thank <laughs> you.